my readers, welcome to November's installment of the Paper and Gram Book Club. Tonight we are reading or discussing our November read, Campaign Widows, which was incredibly entertaining, very much needed this month, and also creepily prophetic, like so many of the books we have read this year together. Um, there have been titles that just felt faded. And I just love that about the reading life. I don't know if you guys are like me, but one of the things I love about reading is that when I read, I feel like I have these incredible just moments where like fate and words intersect. I was reading Where the Crowd Had Sing for my in-person book club, and I'm thinking about doing a special chat um, for patrons for Where the Crowd Had Sing. So many of you have wanted to discuss that book, but I was reading that, and man, there was just like so many faded, um, just like words that felt like they were meant for me in that moment, in that place. And I definitely felt that way with Campaign Widows. So I can't wait to discuss it with you. But first, I want to welcome our amazing patrons who are joining the live filming of our book club for the very first time. So thank you guys for becoming my first literati patrons. It means the world to me that you guys believe in, believe in me and believe in what we do here at Paper and Glam. As I gear up for a glam new year, I am feeling more and more like myself, more and more for just ready to get started. I'm back in like full makeup, you guys. I don't think I've been in full makeup for a video since I filmed my moving announcement, which I didn't even um, have to end up having time to edit and get up. You'll see it eventually. Um, <laughs> but it's just gonna be back now with better lighting and um, full makeup and ready to do it. All right, so let's talk about our icebreaker, which is how do you plan to set the scene for our December read, which is the autobiography of Santa Claus. A lot of us have been talking about just reading ambiance in general and also just being really ready for Christmas and very much ready to just have something to look forward to, something we can count on. So um, I will go first. I am really excited to um, eat the Trader Joe's Peppermint Slims. I got two bags yesterday and I put them like up on a shelf so I won't get into them. Um, listen to, of course, the Glam Christmas playlist on Spotify, which you guys can listen to as well. And I've been curating, curating it for like four years, so it's kind of my life's work. And um, burn the perfect Christmas candle from Bath and Body Works. That's literally what it's called and it's new for this year. And yeah, just read by the tree. Let's see, Emily, are you up next? So Gina, you are up next. I wanted to jump ahead to you, Emily, because you're like super on brand right now. You're ready for this question. <laughs> he is ready. Um, so I think that I'm gonna probably wait to read it until our tree's up and we have been getting a real tree, so it might not be till like the 10th-ish of the month because we don't want our real tree to die because I live in the desert, so if you buy the tree too early, it will be dead long before Christmas. <laughs> it barely lasts the 15 days I needed to from like the 10th to the 15th. Um, so I probably will wait till around then so that I can sit by the tree and read it because I feel like that's definitely something that needs to happen if you're going to read a book that's about Christmas. You need to be doing it by the tree. Maybe um, I'll put like an ambience on like my TV or something um, or maybe my fireplace on. Um, that's kind of in a different room than we usually put our tree. And since we have a little hedgehog who sleeps by the fireplace, we try not to use it too often because we don't want to make her sick. But um, yeah, so something like that, probably a candle. I've been using um, a local company called Fireside Candles. And so I have her subscription box. And so she will be putting out Christmas candles and she lets you choose your scents, your two scents out of her collection. So I'll probably pick a Christmas scent and use that and light that while I'm reading. I'm so uh, excited about Christmas reading and decorating and setting the mood. I am just really needed it this year. It's been a rough year. <laughs> so it's a rough November and I needed to decorate early. Um, and I like right behind me is my reading spot. You can't really see the chair, but it's there. So I can't wait to be curled up in my chair and reading Christmas books. And um, I've 
I've been waiting, holding off on playing the um, like YouTube videos of Disneyland's Main Street decorated for Christmas that plays like the Disneyland playlist of Christmas music. Um, and I love to have that on in the background in uh, during the holidays. Um, and I have uh, the David's Tea Advent Calendar of tea. So I can't wait to open that up and have tea and Christmas music and reading and probably some Trader Joe's holiday snacks too. Um, this is my favorite time of year and I'm so excited about it. So I always have to split my ambiances and ideas into kind of two set of Advent and Christmas season because um, they're two separate things in my world. Um, so I have a, it's Dragonfly Mage's Winter Manor Library soundscape, which is just kind of decked out, like slowly but surely kind of decked out in that cozy winter feeling. Um, there's snow in the background. It's just general like library sounds. Um, and there's purring cats in the background, which not that I need anymore. We have three in our house, so. Um, and then after that, I have Relaxed Day and Night's uh, Celtic Christmas, which just plays like Celtic versions of traditional Christmas songs um, against a kind of cartoony, snowy background. And so I have that, those set up already ready to play. And then I have a Spotify playlist for each season as well. Um, I don't think I have them public, but if somebody wants them, I can probably send them over. And I still have some Necessities brand uh, peppermint crunch tea that I'm excited to drink this winter. I finally finished that off and I finally found a recipe to do knockoff um, cranberry bliss bars from Starbucks last year that I'm most likely going to be breaking out, even though they take way too much effort, <laughs> but they're delicious and they last a couple weeks actually um, in the fridge. So I'll definitely be munching on those. All right. Well, our book chatters tonight, our official book chatters, who you guys all know and love, the OGs, Miss Jaina, Emily, and Anna are on. And in the background of Anna and Jaina's libraries, we see some 2021 book club titles. I won't say which ones they are. Oh, oh that's a surprise. Patrons, you guys already know. The replay is up of the 2021 title debut. There's the printable planner dashboards for you guys. All that is done. If you haven't joined the Patreon experience, we would love to have you. The Patreon Glam Book Club is moving to Patreon exclusively in January 2021, and we have so much planned for a glam new year. Um, so last week we launched, relaunched the Patreon Glam Book Club, and we also relaunched God and Glam for patrons. So we're reading the greatest gift together for God and Glam. So if you would also like to Bible study with us, it's patreon.com slash God and Glam, and I will see you there. It starts on November 30th. All right, so a few of you in the comments have said, how is this going to work with all of our patrons on? And like all things 2020 and gearing up for 2021, I have more questions than answers, so we're going to just figure this out together. You guys are my beta group. You're my investors. I don't know what the best way is to do any of this stuff, but as I took some time this year to get really clear on my value and my values and how I can bring you guys value in the new year, in the new era of our world, and in the new era of our sisterhood at Paper and Glam. And I know what I need more than anything is friends, allies, like-minded community to come together and just share our hearts in a safe space, face to face, right? Like not behind a screen, not behind words on a screen, but really connecting, really talking to each other. Um, you guys got me through this year. I would not have survived without you and you know who you are. And I really just want to create this beautiful safe space for all of us to come together. So Anna Maggie, our other Anna had this idea that we should start theming all of our book chats so we come together and just have like a fun little like outfit or a fun little like cosmetic. So tonight we are doing 
red lipstick, or if you're like a lot of us doing more of like a berry red, to be both patriotic and seasonal. Um, next month, we might do Christmas PJs. We could just do like, you know, a Christmas outfit. We'll discuss it on the Reading Life live stream. Um, but that's really fun that we can see each other face to face, see our homes, see our faces, see our outfits and you know just connect like that so i think what we're going to do for patrons is after every question i will open it up um, to see who wants to pop on and share their thoughts about the question or in this case the christmas ambiance question any patrons on want to share how they are planning to read the autobiography of santa claus I think Amazon. I can I can go. Oh, hi Marissa. Hello. Um, I had just said that I am going to wait till I put up my little four foot Christmas tree. Um, and then I'm just going to read it with my advent calendar of hot cocoa and listen to a Christmas playlist that I made and light one of my many Christmas candles. Since I have like four of them, I'll have to choose one. I love it. Marissa, I know Marissa. I know all, have known all of you guys for years. Marissa is a longtime Paper and Glam subscriber, a longtime member of this community. Is there anything else you want to add to um, introduce your, you, Marissa? I, of course, know more, but I, you know, I can just say that I love being a part of Paper and Glam. I'm from New York City, um, Long Island, um, particularly, and that's it. It's just nice being on. Well, thank you. Thank you for being an early member of our Patreon community from the very beginning. And I think you've joined every single live stream. And I say this all the time, but there's no anonymity in Paper and Glam. I know how, I know who all of you guys are. I know where you live. You know, it's like, I know. <laughs> that, was, that was creepy, but meant to be funny. <laughs> you know, I, I know all of you guys and I love that I get to actually meet you face to face now. So thank you for joining Marissa. And then Marissa actually so graciously demoed um, how to upgrade your account to from our bibliophile tier, our current patron tier, to our literati tier. So thank you so much, Marissa. If you have questions about how you get on this thing, uh, she has showed you over on Patreon. So thank you, Marissa. Anyone else want to talk about uh, Christmasness? Going once, going twice. I can't tell if you're going to unmute Anna, Maggie. <laughs> okay, she said no. Okay, let's get to campaign widows. All righty. So our first question, as always, is what is your experience of campaign widows? How did you take it in? How did it hit you? And how many ballots would you uh, rate it? So if you're watching live, either on the Zoom chat or you're watching live on the replay on YouTube, you can use that little ballot box to um, add your rating. I have to say this was three ballots for me. It was very much like as advertised, you know what I mean? It was exactly what I expected. Um, I thought it was really well done. I learned a lot about the campaign season. And one of my favorite shows of all time, if not my very favorite show, is The West Wing. Um, and it really kind of reminded me of that, that like behind the scenes peek at just like campaigns, which I really enjoyed about The West Wing. Um, so yeah, I listened to it and I loved the audio. The audio was incredibly well performed. The actor who performed it had voices for all of the widows and I don't know how she did it, but she nailed it. Like they sounded exactly like what I thought they would sound like in my head. I know a lot of you like Librarian Anna, I'm sure we'll talk about this, had trouble following it and I really didn't. And I think that's because from the beginning, I had all these different voices, and it was just incredibly well done, in my opinion, and just the levity that I needed um, in my life this month. <laughs> How about you, Miss Jaina? So, the same. I give it three. Um, obviously, this uh, for those of you who have been here a while, this is not like my typical wheelhouse, like um, kind of more... Um, chiclet or romantic fiction but i wouldn't say romance was really part of this but like just not like typical contemporary fiction isn't my um thing but so like three it's a fun read i liked it there are things i liked about it there are things i didn't but i think overall it's a well put together book and it um gives you exactly what you think there were things that um were just really fun and lighthearted, and i think 
it was a nice way to look at the election season um, rather than watching our real election season, <laughs> but still have kind of some of that intensity and stress, but without like the actual reality of the intensity and stress. So that was really nice. I didn't finish this book. I failed at all of the book clubs I belong to this month. <laughs> it's been a rough month, like I said. Um, the, and I wanted to be able to like be into this book as sort of an escape, but I just had so much trouble focusing this month. And there were so many characters that it was just hard to keep everybody straight. Uh, in the beginning, I think Lisa Marie hit on something there that maybe if there had been, if I was listening to it and hearing like a different style for every person, it would have been easier to remember who everyone was. I found myself wishing that, remember in um, the Babysitter's Club books that each babysitter had a font and they like wrote the beginning of it that I was wishing that they had a different font for the characters in this book so I could know who was talking and who like, who they went with and what their job was right away. That was just something that I couldn't get in, that made it really hard to, for me to get into. Um, so where I am right now, I think about page 200, something like that, I would give it two ballot boxes. Though I did read some reviews that said it picks up at the end and everything kind of comes together easier at the end. So we'll see how it turns out. So I think I'm in the minority here. I didn't enjoy this book. Um, I gave it two ballots at the very end. Um, I started it as the paperback at the very beginning of the month and it literally sat there. Uh, this bookmark literally sat at the beginning of the book for most of the month, to be honest. Um, and finally, someone mentioned the audiobook was really good on the Patreon live stream. And so I was able to grab that from my local library. Um, and so I was able to start that. And that helped a lot. It really, really did. And I would honestly, the only reason why it wasn't one star is because of the audiobook. Um, the narrator, like Lisa Marie said, is absolutely fantastic. Um, I might actually have to find other audiobooks by her. Um, but yeah, there were just, there were a lot of characters and it jumped between points of view in, within the chapter. If it was just like each character had their own chapter, I think I would have understood it a lot better. But the fact that it switched between all of them within a chapter just kind of threw my mind completely for a loop. Um, but yeah, I actually finished it during my lunch break today. So I'm kind of surprised that I was able to finish it. Um, but it is, it is what it's advertised as. It's a bit of a more lighthearted read, um, which is needed this time of year, especially, especially this year with our current uh, political climate in the U.S. as well as um, the pandemic going on worldwide. So I did appreciate it for that. And the writing style was really good. It was just the way that the characters and some of just the way that it was actually executed kept me kind of kept me a little bit disappointed. <laughs> all right, so I have already been having so much fun chatting with all of you guys in the comments. So if you haven't been reading along with us for more than a year, we used to film live on YouTube. So we were all, the book chatters were there, everyone was watching live, and we stopped being able to do that in August of 2019 when YouTube discontinued Google Hangouts functionality and we went to pre-recording on Zoom. And it's just so much fun to actually like just chat about different things on the side. And we have already decided that for our Christmas bookish live streams, so our reading life live stream, which is the third Thursday of every month, next month it is December 10th, we are going to be wearing Christmas pajamas. And then for our book club live filming, which is December 16th, that's for the autobiography of Santa Claus. We're going to wear ugly Christmas sweaters. 
And then you will see us live on YouTube on December 17th. So just a reminder while we're at it, everything is a week early this week and of, or excuse me, this month and um, next month because of Thanksgiving and Christmas, just like it has been every year for seven years. But um, just, I know it can be so many things going on and I, I don't want to miss you guys in your ugly Christmas sweaters and your pajamas. So um, I think that's a plan, plan and so fun to plan all of this um, with you guys. We planned a lot of our Reading Life live streams um, over on Patreon last Thursday, and then I put them all into a fun planner dashboard for you guys. Those are all out on the Google Drive, and I just kind of like, I, I planned like a Christmas book exchange for next year for those who want to participate. I planned like a spooky stories party, and I just love that you guys are all on board, and you can see all of those in the dashboard. Um, and there we by no means set in stone if we have great ideas along the way, like we just had in the chat, we'll just adjust. One of the beauties of having a digital uh, dashboard is I can just change it. All right, so next question is, uh, oh, I'm so glad you guys are so excited for all the same, all the things, the same. Um, all right, which widow did you most relate to? Which widow would you want to be friends with and why? So I have to say almost like a tie between Jay and Birdie. I just thought Jay was hilarious. Um, the narrator really crushed him, in my opinion. Like, you really got just like the, his dry sense of humor, and he just seemed to be really type awesome. I don't know. Like, him and Birdie were just like, really relatable to me, probably because um, I really felt like Birdie kind of manifested her dreams. You know, she built this event planning business. She had, I was just picturing her like really cool like townhouse office next to like her real house. And I thought that was a really cool, like dreamy idea um, to have like your commute be like a walk next door. Right. I thought that was really fun. Um, I have this dream of like owning property in Napa and like building up like a barn and like making that like paper and glam HQ. Um, so that kind of hit close to home for me. Um, and then Jay just was like, yeah, he just was so funny, and you could tell he was an editor, which I don't know, I really related to that, just in the way that he was constantly editing his life, and constantly, um, almost, yeah, just like overanalyzing his life, and, and when you edit, whether that's video, or like you're editing yourself, it's weird, it's like, it creates this weird double life, where you're like experiencing yourself, and being yourself at once, and librarian Anna has seen that with me this year because usually my, my team would see that where I'm like triple editing myself like does this make sense but anyway I just related to that experience because it, it plays out in relationships too where you're like trying to always experience things from like the other people whether the, that's you know the internet or like you know the people in your close relationships it's it just spoke close to my heart when you have that like editor personality it just like seeps into everything and I just found myself laughing out loud because a the narration was great and got his humor like spot on and uh, b he was just a totally well-drawn character how about you Ms. Jaina my guess it would have to be Reagan just because she's like working mom we have a husband who's super busy um, with his job and really dedicated to that. So she's trying to work and, you know, maintain her career um, or some parts of her career, although different than what she had before children and also be a mom and be pregnant, but also like still like have fun and, and be married. And she wants to go out and do stuff, but like she has like kids and so she like can't. So I think um, all of those things relate to me and you know um just like how she can like write stuff like off the cuff and like it's funny like i'm have totally written people's um groomsmen speeches for them about people i don't even know um they'll just tell me like oh the couple's like this and then i will write their speech for them and they will tell me how great their speech was and so like i think those things i relate to her about and then as far as who i i think i would want to be friends with birdie because um, Birdie just seems like a fun person to be friends with. And I think I like to be friends with those type awesome people, even though I'm not super type awesome. I, those are probably like the parts about Reagan. Reagan's kind of type A too, right? Like super scheduled and I'm not like that. Like I'm a crazy hot mess, um, totally crazy hot mess everywhere I go. I just like let people know that before I even come in. Um, and I just like Birdie and I like, I do think that like Birdie and, um, her husband's relationship 
Bernie and Buck's relationship, like how they're like totally like together. Like I do like that. And like, you know, um, and their little games and stuff. I think that's super cute. And like my husband and I have been together forever. Um, we don't have like their history, which is sad for them, not for us. <laughs> that's, that's, um, really great for us that we don't have their history, but you know, just like how they like kind of know each other, but like kind of like to bug each other and stuff. I think that like my husband and I are kind of like that. We've been together for a really long time and we know each other really well, but we also like purposely like to irritate each other. Like he doesn't like lenticular pictures, like holograms and stuff. So if one comes in the mail or something, I'll totally like sneak into his car and put it where he'll have to touch it to irritate him because I know he doesn't like that texture. <laughs> so just like things like that. Um, I had a hard time relating to all of the characters in this book. Um, I, and I think that was part of why I was struggling with it, that I just didn't connect to anybody uh, in particular. Um, though if I was going to sort of latch onto somebody, it would probably be Katie. Um, and I think it's just because of that, just as a reader too, I was the, you know, coming into this group, like being the new person um, in an already sort of established group of people. Um, I think that's such a hard thing to do all the time anyway. And I always, um, and also every time I was reading this, it reminded me of Katie from Mean Girls, who had the a similar experience in that she was the new girl coming in <laughs> to a place that already had positions for everybody. Um, and that sort of just that universal feeling of everyone else knows where they belong. Um, but, and I agree with what has been said before about wanting to be uh, friends with Birdie. I think she's the kind of entertaining friend uh, that everybody needs to have. Um, and so I it thought it was like fun to read her parts. Um, I just didn't necessarily like super connect with any of them. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, just that they were kind of really hard to relate to. And I don't know if it's just like my stage of life or just because of how they were um, portrayed in the books, but I had a hard time relating to any of them. But I think if I'm going to uh, say which ones I would relate to the most, um, I would probably pick Katie and Reagan. Um, I love Katie's like relentless optimism, but also being a complete overthinker because I tend to do that myself. Um, and Reagan just dealt with a lot over that election season, um, while also being pregnant. And I'm like, I definitely feel that, um, this year. Um, and I also just really admire the fact that she was able to deal with so much, but then also found so much, uh, kind of fulfillment being a freelance writer was, which would allow her to work from home. And I'm, I kind of love that. So. Um, I think, however, though, I would want to be friends with Maddie out of all of them because she, even though um, I can't really agree with her basically sabotaging her husband's campaign, she was doing it for the right reasons, even if they didn't couldn't see what those reasons were. <laughs> um, and I also just love the fact that she was like so unapologetically who she was the entire time. <laughs> throughout the book um, and wasn't trying to like fit into a mold that everybody else was trying to turn her into. Um, and so she, she was just so entertaining and the sweetest person um, within the book. So I would want her as like a best friend or a big sister. Any patrons want to comment on their most relatable widow? I asked in the chat, but I'm opening it up. I totally agree with what you said, Anna, about um, Maddie. She, I mean, she was giving me anxiety just reading about like her antics. I was like, horrible anxiety, like <laughs> just reading about how she like flew by the seat of her pants. Cause I just, I can't do that. You know, like I'm a planner. I like spontane spontaneity is my kryptonite. I mean, <laughs> like can't function. I mean, like literally the entire year planned out, um, as you guys know. 
So I love that. Um, and those of you who are thinking about joining us live, um, don't feel like you need to be face to face. If you guys feel like you just want to join and listen in, that's totally fine. Um, Emily reminded me that, you know, it can be intimidating joining a group. A lot of us have gotten to know each other just over the years from Facebook and just from watching Book Club Live. And then this year when we moved to Zoom, um, Forgotten Glam and then, and then of course Book Club Patreon, we um, have gone to know each other, but please jump in. You'd be glad you did. If you just want to like dip your toe in, you can always just be silent, no camera. Um, it's totally fine too. Or join in on the party. D dive right in. <laughs> One of my favorite podcasts, which is the Day Luna podcast, always calls it a, a dive in bee. And they're always like, be a dive in bee. And I'm like, I always laugh so hard because it's like such a funny like sentiment. Um, and all right, so number three, or excuse me, yeah, number three. Campaign Winner shows us a behind the scenes peak at election season. Did this fictionalized account from several perspectives, party planner, commentator, campaign staff, journalist, and reporter, give you any insight into the election? So I personally thought this was a very well developed like premise, you know, just seeing this from all the different perspectives, again, really made me feel like that throwback to the West Wing. And um, yeah, I, I guess I had forgotten how like glamorous politics can be to those who are really close to it. Because I think that we, um, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but you know, watching the election and the pol political stuff is like the least glamorous thing I can potentially think of, right? But um, the being like at all the parties and like, like it's its own kind of society. And I loved how they were talking about um, the, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on what it's called. One of you guys might have to save me. Um, the, the prom for nerds. Uh, my cousin went a couple years ago and um, during the Obama administration, I cannot think of what it's called, but just the way that um, they kept saying like, it's Hollywood for ugly people, or they, the narrator kept saying it's Hollywood for ugly people. It's, um, you know, like prom for nerds, I was just cracking up just all the beautiful parties and just like all the like the money that goes into just like planning, um, planning these events and all the, the work that goes into planning these events like literally starts like the day after the, the election, they start on the new one. And I kind of just forgot about that. I think that like planning a whole year of paper and glam is, is a lot, especially right now as a one woman army. And I was just thinking, man, I can't imagine planning like a presidential election where you're literally planning like a four year period um, of your life and then potentially to take office, right? Then to like take on a whole new career. Um, so yeah. Uh, did you have any any thoughts about the behind the scenes political stuff, Ms. Jana? Yeah, I think that it was like a good little like taste test of it that you got to see some of it. I don't think obviously since that wasn't like the main premise, it was more about these individuals and the, their characters. Um, we only get like a dabble in it because I think that if we were really looking at those things specifically, like. Um, like if it was just focused on Birdie and how she does like the dinners and the parties, I think we, it could be a lot more um, complicated and more nuanced, but I think that it's a good little like taste of what's going on behind the scenes and like the stress of the staffers, like when Goodfellow's like, meh, you know, like, or like his, you know, um, like his head P PR person, right, Mike, like how he like is always trying to like control Maddie and like make sure she stays in her box and just shows you that like no matter what like you think is coming out of a president or a presidential candidate or any type of candidate's mouth it's all being being filtered through other people the speech writers the team around them that unless with the very few exceptions you're not really getting what that person is like or who that person really is, you're getting a facade. And um, I don't think that a lot of people in like our country or any country necessarily understand how much of a crafted facade it is, particularly because the election is, right? It's all a facade, it's all pretend. Like as far as what you're putting on, it's all a show. 
And then like what you really do once you're in the job might be completely different because um, now you have a job that you've never done before and nobody can really tell you how to do other than like the handful of people who have also had it. So it's not really a job that like everyone even understands, I think, unless until you're like there. I liked the sort of like peek behind the curtain aspect of uh, this book that, um, especially that it, it wasn't the people whose perspectives we were getting weren't necessarily the candidates that it was like, you know, what goes on behind the scenes and how many people and, you know, how many balls are in the air all the time and things, you know, that you don't see, but that go on to like make it look perfect. like. Jana was saying that, you know, set the stage like it is a show, that there are so many moving parts that you don't see. Um, and so I thought that was definitely interesting. And uh, Lisa Grace, you said a little bit about at the beginning that there were things that uh, were oddly prophetic about this book. And I think some of that was also contributed to why I had a hard time reading this, uh, particularly like Rocky Hayes' character, where I, who was not the same as Kanye West, but that it was just like, oh, is this really happening? Are we really taking this seriously? <laughs> like, that was just kind of too much for this particular election <laughs> season, I guess. Um, that I, there were just like some things that, that really did feel like, I'd just been so exhausted by the election season that reading more about it and, you know, finding out more things about maybe things that weren't necessarily great going on behind the scenes was a little hard to swallow sometimes. For sure. I was drawing uh, Rocky Hayes and Kanye comparisons a lot, even though Rocky Hayes really wasn't like her own character within the book like she was there but she was just kind of it was like all the other husbands it was just kind of like oh cool you're there um and yeah I did think that the back kind of the background tidbits of what uh what's going on behind the scenes in the election season was kind of cool to see um I just wanted more out of it because again, we saw some from so many different points of view that it was like, it was very hard to get any depth and nuance um, from the events that were happening. And with the side characters kind of being the main focus instead of the actual like presidential candidates, it wasn't as more, what's the word? I don't know, it was just lacking. Um, but I really, I did think it was kind of cool, but also, yeah, it was just a little bit too prophetic for this year. Um, just like most of our books on the list for the for 2020. Um, but I did, there was a line, I think it was later in the book, they were talking about um, what Rocky Hayes would do if she planned on running for re-election. And I love how she had said something along the lines of, I'm not going to plan to run for re-election because I don't want it to take away from the job I'm doing this four years and I never really thought about it but it's like Lisa Marie said it's like the minute one election season ends you start planning for the next one and like no wonder they keep no wonder it's like everything seems so much more intense during election season and then the actual like lawmaking parts of it are just kind of like okay yeah we said a bunch of words during our campaign but this is what we're actually doing um, and so I really like the fact that, uh, Rocky Hayes kind of brought, or that was brought up in this book, um, by the kind of from out of left field candidate. Um, but, and I also just really like the, that they touched on being able to bow out of the election because with Hank, he was so intent on just like keep going keep going keep going but then finally he was like uh, maddie's insisting he's like why am i doing this this isn't what i love to do and i think that's also been kind of another theme for 
uh, my own life, but also kind of paper and glam in general too. It's like doing everything for free and doing everything because everybody's saying you should be doing it this way. But instead, he was able to do a lot more good by going back to his roots and getting back to what really mattered to him and his family. And so I appreciated that. Yeah, Anna, that really resonated with me too. Um, Especially when Hank was, and this goes back to what Jaina was saying, when Hank said like, just tell me what to believe, you know, like you could tell he, it's like what Maddie was saying. He wasn't enjoying it. He was just doing it as kind of like the next thing, you know, because he'd he'd like conquered all these other things. and And then as soon as he decides not to run, he's like back to himself and yeah it's it was a very interesting like exploration um of of like maddie and hank's values too which yeah just resonated super deeply i mean it's such good points anna um it's been a year of just like getting back to basics you know and i've never felt more like myself so i'm excited for all that's to come all right number four what would each widow have to say about the idea of having it all the notion of successfully balancing personal and professional lives how does this theme relate to your own life so i know i kind of include questions like this very often and you know in the paper and glam book club we do prioritize female authors um not you know we don't read all female authors but um we prioritize them because the female experience is the thing that wakes me up in the morning, the art and science of living and the communication of traditional feminine values and what that means. And, you know, for me, I've gone on this like, you know, dark night of the soul this, this year, as Anna was mentioning, and you guys have, you know, seen play out. And um, I just kind of have realized that all of the issues I've had, like professionally, personally, relationally, have all come from me operating out of like conventional wisdom as opposed to what God has called me to do and what like how God has called me to live as a woman in the world, as a business owner in the world, as, um, you know, for, for my specific plan, um, for his specific plan for my life. So a lot of the books do tend to explore that theme, even if I'm not necessarily expecting it on, on page 109. Um, Maddie says, like most women, she knew growing up that, sorry, like most women she knew growing up and the one who she was raised by and the women she believed she actually, and the women she believed she actually was, sorry, and the woman she believed she actually was deep in her heart in constant motion, doing a million different things at once, children, jobs, husbands, while the guys did one or two things and did, and then talked about how great, how great Sorry, I can't read tonight, you guys. Um, How great they were. I feel like I need to read that again. (laughs) Um, um, And then just just goes on to say, she tossed her boxy decoy dress, which 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 had worn all evening onto the bed, buttoned her suit jacket, smoothed out the fine wool, and tied the scarf around her neck. She nodded at her reflection in the mirror, applied a bit of fashion tape to her suit jacket, smoothing it against her chest. So one thing I will say, which you guys pointed out, is the sentence structure is like a little bit choppy in this book. It was even like hard for me to like, like as I was hearing that, I'm like, wait, did I miss something? Um, Because it it is really, really choppy. Um, So that was Maddie talking about just like this feeling that like we, like we do need to stay in constant motion. Um, And on the God and Glam live streams this month, we explored like the divine feminine and um, this idea of fullness of life and what that looks like um, from a godly perspective. And she just touches on that. And you can, and she is just like playing a character, you know, and she, but she also has so much more to do. Um, you know, like she needs a stylist and she needs like fashion tape. And her image is, of course, going to be scrutinized much more acutely than her husband, who is actually running for. Um, the election. And then I also felt like the epigraph to this book really spoke to that as well from Eleanor Roosevelt that says, campaign behavior for wives, colon, always be on time, do as little talking as humanly possible, lean back in the parade car so everybody can see the president. And um, when I read that epigra- epigraph, I was like, okay, we're, we're gearing up for a little commentary on uh, the female experience and specifically the, the, the female political experience as 
as the like sidekick, so to speak, to someone who who's running. Um, Jane, I think it was you in the chat said you would like to hear um, a little bit more of Rocky Hayes's husband's experience, and and I would too. So yeah, um, as far as answering the question, oh, I don't know what every widow would have to say. I feel like we really saw Reagan struggling with that the most, or maybe the most, um, like with the most commentary, and just how she she had that column where she was kind of walking through this journey as an advice columnist while simultaneously figuring it all out, um, which is something I really related to as well. So I don't know that I have a really well articulate, articulated answer for all of the widows, but that was what was going through my head when I was thinking about this question. What, what popped up for you, Jana? Well, um, I think like you brought up uh, Reagan's column and that really reminded me of um, the book we read was it Stray Ed is that the book um, like her column definitely had like that same kind of like vibe to it and so I liked that aspect of it and I think she is trying to have it all like she's not trying to be a full-on speech writer anymore but she's trying to get that like writing vibe in where she can and still like rock it um, all the while being wife mom pregnant and have fun with her friends, right? Like she is trying to have it all, but that's also why she's like totally like me and like chasing her kids around and like the secret service agent is like, ah, like what's wrong with you woman? Um, and that's how I feel everywhere I go. Um, just so you guys know, like I totally feel that. But I also think that Katie um, has a little bit of that because the whole like Jackson thing where he's like upset at her progress and she he doesn't feel like she's like, giving him much, enough attention and like praise for his awesomeness at being like part of this campaign. Um, and she is giving him praise and stuff. So like, I don't understand like where, where he's missing that. Like, and so she's kind of, and she's like, I never asked you to do this or this or this, like, this is your, like, like, this is like, you thought you had to do that for me. Like you thought that you needed to give me that ring. Like you like, so it was, I think the kind of like the perception of having it all from the outside, like from the male perspective is a little bit like explored through that situation. Whereas like, then it, that's balanced um, through Parker. Right. And where he just like wants her for her and like, he enjoys her success and he wants to be like successful, like alongside her. And I do think there is a little bit of a different dichotomy there. And I think that having it all means something different to everyone, right? Like Buck and Bertie chose not to have a family, but they chose that together. And then they like keep in rhythm. So I think it's a little bit of like, um, yes, like I see in the chat that, that the affair was totally predictable. And it was like, I saw it from like um, page one. And so I think everyone did, right? Cause it was such an awkward thing. Um, but yeah, so I think that having it all might mean something different to every woman too, because our desires are all different. And I do think the book did a good job of exploring like how different women have different desires. And so they're not all trying to strive for the exact same thing. And I think that is an important thing to note. Jane is over here taking the words right out of my mouth. So I'm just going to go on with this, uh, this quote from page 332, um, that, uh, it's when, um, Ted is coming home and when his son is born near the end, um, he's like, I know you don't need me, but I want to be around more. Okay. He said, squeezing Reagan's hand, a workaholic who's around a little more and who knows? Maybe I'll be a mamaholic who works a little more. She said, not right the second this way. <laughs> um, and I just, I thought that was like really nice because it's like one of Ted's struggles that I was seeing, at least in the scenes that he was having again, was just that he was missing out on his kids growing up. And then of course, like he completely misses um, his son's birth and that obviously like affects him and but then also you have Reagan who's enjoying being a stay-at-home mom but she's having to find like that thing that's just still her that's still something that she does um for her not necessarily for anybody else and so I really did appreciate that and yeah the the Katie arc was super predictable for sure um 
and yeah and I agree with everybody that Jackson was definitely shady from the start and really had no business trying to just kind of follow the the line of how things should go when it, it just ended up a total mess and but I think in the end it worked out for Katie because she her, her story got tied up with a nice little bow near the end so yeah the chat um everyone's saying the Katie arc was super predictable and it really was just with meeting Parker you could tell from like the first slider they were gonna get together and you could tell Jackson was gonna be just a total dud and just not there from a maturity perspective. Um, one thing that bugged me a little bit about the book was like how young Katie was. Um, allegedly, that's just something that's a little bit of a pet peeve in my, um, in, like in literature where like, and even in, you know, like mainstream shows and like reality shows, like no one's over 30. You guys remember when we read The Favorite Sister and that was like a joke where everybody just lies about their age, which they do in real life. Um, how like once you're past like 34, you're like, like you, no one's ever past 34. And then someone who's, who's 34, I thought that, that was hilarious. And yeah, the fact that she was like really high up in like in New York, um, you know, big show in New York, and then, like, was moving to D.C., and, like, also was engaged, and all these things. I just, you guys know from the time we read, like, Europe, yes, that I really struggle against that, that narrative. Um, not that we can't have it all, and Karen, I think we might use, we talk about this all the time, but, um, that, like, we should have it all by 30, you know, um, that is just, I, like, want to redact that every time I see a show or every time I see uh, a book with that plot point, just because it's, it's, I think it's done so much um, damage to, to me and um, kind of maybe all of us growing up. I don't know. We don't have to have it all figured out by 30. All right. And no one does. <laughs> okay. So number five. So this is a really interesting question that I thought a lot about as well. Um, how is the theme of interdependence woven throughout the novel? What type of message does the story send about believing in yourself and taking chances? Um, so I, I really liked how the theme of sisterhood was woven throughout the story and how they really didn't have, none of the women, even though it seemed like they were outwardly successful, were inwardly successful until they had that group of, of allies like rooting for each other and who were there for each other they they found their friends who they could call at like 2 a.m right like Reagan kept calling Katie to watch her kids and it's like we all need I think a lot more of those 2 a.m friends than we used to because the the world is too crazy and we you know we needed them from the beginning so um just this idea of of interdependence is something that that I've been thinking about a lot just because my my business coach and Mac has always said you you're you know independence totally well, but you know, you're not gonna be able to like get to where you wanna be until you learn interdependence. You know, I'm an only child. I was raised by a single mom entrepreneur and you know, I to my core know about independence. And in a lot of ways that was my undoing this year. And so just this idea of, of interdependence uh, and the way that that was a plot line throughout the book, um, I thought was really well done. Did you have any thoughts on interdependence throughout the novel, Miss Jaina? So like you, like it's something that I struggle with because I'm super independent as the only girl in my family and always around boys my whole life who um, like even the, like not just my brothers, but all their friends just really like treated me like the bratty little sister. So I just always was like kind of strong and alone and kind of doing my own thing. So I struggle a lot with interdependence. I think in the job I'm in now and um, with quarantine and having to like recraft my job as the activities director. Um, I have a coworker who like I've had to lean on a lot. Um, and so like that has given me some interdependence with her, but I still don't think like, I don't think I would call her like in the middle of the night about like a life crisis necessarily, but maybe some other things I have. Um, I just think for me, I always struggle with stuff like this in books because I feel like it's um, set up for me like a narrative of something I want to achieve with friendship, but I've never been able to. So it just kind of makes me like sad, you know, like it's just something I feel like 
um like I think with paper and glam we have it but we're also like far away so it's like I'm not gonna just like call up and show up at your house and like I am very spontaneous so I'm the type of person that would want to do that um and I think I've had like pockets of it here and there but I I think I have a lot of like personal like I don't feel like people really want me there or like that kind of stuff so I think that it's it's kind of hard for me um as a person and I'm going to stop talking because it just is rambling now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very similar. I mean, being very, um, even basically raised as an only child. So I definitely feel that struggle. And then there, of course, like I had mostly guy friends growing up. I had, so kind of figuring out what sisterhood and interdependence looks like and what it actually means and how to really nurture that is very difficult. Um, and I find it easier to do in an online community like Paper and Glam, but definitely like, you need that in person as well, which is very diff uh, even more difficult um, this year uh, with the pandemic. And that's like everything we always, act like what we do doesn't matter but in the end it really does whether it's just um if it's affecting you know our families well then that affects if something we do affects our families then it's going to affect how our family goes out and um affects somebody else somebody else and then that person's going to take that home and it's, it's just a spiral effect no matter good or bad um like you hear about those uh things at like restaurants where people like start the chain reactions of you know you pay for the car behind you's coffee and they pay it forward um and so I'm still trying to figure out how to do that um and so I really did appreciate seeing it kind of happen it almost seems like it happened unrealistically in the book but at the same time like how else would it have happened and sometimes there's friendships that you create like that that just kind of naturally occur or the ones that you have to actually work at and so I liked how it, it seemed kind of like both like they were just very very welcoming to Katie who's the new girl on the block and then they you know they went with Maddie and um I just I wish they would have talked to Jay a bit, little bit more um because they kind of showed the women being together a lot more than they brought in Jay, but so it kind of seemed like Jay's story wasn't as important, which was a little sad to me. Um, but yeah, I definitely agreed with that. But I also love the fact that um, the second part of the question was what type of message does the story send about believing in yourself and taking chances? Well, most of them wouldn't have been able to take any of the chances they did if they didn't have that group to fall back on. And so being able to see that and see it in action um, was just pretty awesome. That really reminded me of um, Untamed, which is my favorite book from 2020. Um, spoiler alert for our Reading Life live stream. Uh, so for our December Reading Life live stream, we're going to share the best book we read in 2020 and why you should read it. And so I guess I'll get an early start. But I read it kind of before everything fell apart for me. And so I missed this quote that, and then Kristen Blanchard sent it to me. Like she took a, a picture of the screen and it said, you know, you, th you think you built this community for other people, but maybe you built it because uh, it's what you needed to fall into. Um, and I just felt like that related very much to what Jaina was saying about like feeling like an outsider. And I touched on this earlier, but um, because I have such an extreme personality and paper glam tends to attract extreme personalities, a lot of us think like experience the world as as outsiders and we talked a lot about this on god and glam and the enneagram and stuff and i won't go too deep into it but um a lot of us are like in the small percentage uh numbers on the enneagram so like uncommon uh, types to be like 60 to 70 percent of people are like sixes or sevens and it's funny we did this community-led discussion of the enneagram where we had someone from each number talk about their experience of being um you know their number and i couldn't find anyone who was a six or a seven and i was like wait like 
like 70% of people are a six or a seven. <laughs> and Chelsea's on, she's, she was supposed to be our seven. Um, and then I, and I was like, oh, well that makes sense because you know, we're, we're all like extreme personalities in this group um, and have, and do have that, that feeling um, of isolation. And so many times we've talked about, right? Like not having planner friends or book friends or seasonal living friends in real life and then finding each other and being like, oh, there's others like me. And one of the reasons, um, one of the dreams, I guess, I have for Paper and Glam is that we get big enough to where, like, you do meet people in real life, right? Like, on a chat, you find out, like, someone lives in your state and lives in your town, and then you meet up in real life. And that's happened. Like, so many people have met at planner meetups, have met at Michael's, um, have met, you know, in, in various places because they, like, saw Paper and Glam stickers. And I just think that's really really cool like we're we're a bigger force than i think i realize um I, a lot of you guys have pointed out that like on amazon that like if you look at one of our book club picks like all the other picks from like previous year cup years come up i know anna has shared that like at the library she like laughs when she sees like the, like a couple of the book club picks like be checked out together and you know we are everywhere um, and i say all the time but no anonymity in being friends am so i just love this idea that like at, at some point, like we can really get to know each other face to face and find that um, that like minded community because it really is hard to find um, in real life and even more so now, right? Like it's the thing we need the most and the thing the thing that's the most elusive. All right, so we're going to talk about the end now, and we don't do spoilers. If you're new, we don't do spoilers um, in the Paper and Glam Book Club without fair warning. So if you don't want to know how the book ends. Um, pause and keep keep us in mind when you finish the book but we're going to we're going to end it so um the book ends with these prophetic words <laughs> in the epilogue it was the closest election in history with the re results delayed until absentee ballots had been counted and recounted in a number of battleground states insert recount in georgia all right <laughs> But now the country is ready to celebrate the dawn of a new administration, dot, dot, dot. And then Rocky Hayes wins the election. And when I first read that, because like we had been talking about, I all, I totally thought that um, Rocky Hayes was a play on Kanye because like Jana had said, he had announced his run as early as 2016 and no one was really ever sure if that was a joke or if that was true but it was still like floating around. Like the idea was floating around. So this, I was like, when did this book get published? And I believe it got published in early 2017, which means she probably finished it like early 2016. So it's like, you know, razor thin margin there, whether she actually knew that, that Connie was gonna run. And then I was like, okay, this couldn't really happen. There's no, you know, because elections are typically run won by career politicians, right? They're typically won by people like Joe Biden who've been who've been politicians for 50 years. And then I was like, this would never happen. Then I was like, wait, Donald Trump was essentially like a business celebrity influencer who won. I was like, what are you talking about? Of course this could happen. And um, then I was thinking like, wait, had he even won that election yet? You know, because we don't really know when she finished it. Like there's a long, long, runway for books to get published because you have to finish the book it has like there's tons of editing then you have to get in line like at production for all the books to be finished um so all that to say i was like man i wonder like how much of every like how prophetic this really was but one thing's for sure like that last like finisher was crazy and the fact that i finished this book um the saturday after like of election week and and things were still up in the air and I was like that's so creepy to like have that experience on that day and my mom and I got up early that day it just kind of been like a weird dreaming week right like election week just like sucked the air out of the room like the whole the whole week so my mom and I got up early we got coffee and they had like red white and blue um sugar cookies and I got a peppermint mocha breaking protocol and like took my picture and I was just like man this is what I love about the paper and then book club that like I talked about at the beginning is there's all these like faded bookish intersections of the reading life and real life and you know I set that up be, you know in some ways with our seasonal reading but sometimes it's like I don't read these books before we you know before we read them together because that doesn't sound fun to me I want to experience them with you in real time in their season and it's creepy like I know some of you guys like stopped reading in March because the testaments was so 
like it felt like it was written about what was actually happening. And I'm sorry, I think I gave some of you post-traumatic stress on accident, but I mean, like, it was just creepy. So um, I finished this book really early because, you know, I'm trying to get kind of ahead as I start, um, like I just started my In Real Life book club um, yes, last night and getting ready for it to start reading pretty significantly for God and Glam um, every Monday. And then, um, you know, of course, our book club and the Patreon um, reading life live stream. So I tried to get ahead and yeah, it was just like so, so weird to have, to have that experience that I wanted to tell everyone I like was messaging Anna. I was like, Anna, like, where are you in the book? Like, <laughs> like, cause I like wanted to like talk to someone about it, but no one had finished it. And I was like, no. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Anna's usually finished it like before I've started it. So I was like low key stalking people to see where they were in the book because I wanted to be like, oh my God, um, we did it again. It was like, I want to play like Britney Spears. Oops, we did it again. <laughs> And now this year, all the titles for 2020, uh, for 2021 are patron voted, or many of them. Um, so you guys have complicity in with me when this happens again, which I hope it does. So, uh, what were your closing thoughts on the end of the book? Um, how did you feel about the tone? Um, how did you feel about the way the author chose to conclude uh, the story, Ms. Jana? Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like it was set up to be like, the close race like there was heavy heavy foreshadowing of that throughout right like even how close the primaries were and um i think that as prophetic as it is it's not far-fetched obviously like from our present election but like um pretty much since about 2000 right since the bush Gore election we haven't had an election with the exception of obama that hasn't had some pretty heavy, tight race, some, you know, some type of um, questions in some states about, uh, you know, what, what happened. And so I do think that um, she's hitting on the pulse of like, the security of our election and what's going on in the tightness, and really showing that our country as, um, I mean, right, it's why she pulls in, Rocky Hayes pulls in, like, She's like, well, I was running on this party. She pulls somebody from like the other party, right? To make a mixed platform and to kind of show that like, um, as a country, we, we are almost split 50, 50. That's why we keep having this, these really tight races. And I think someone with a mixed platform like that might actually do better. Like, I don't know if it's prophetic that maybe in the next four years, somebody tries that and starts a new party right like a half of this and a half of that like would that be effective like that's the question it raises for me because i think that's really interesting and um, it gets really down to like politics and pol to policy rather than politics because i think that um in the mainstream world politics is what we see but we really should be focusing on policy and i felt like that was a major theme running through it through the Rocky Hayes campaign is that we have an issue in our country where we don't look at policy as voters. And I'm not saying like anyone in this room or anyone listening particularly, but it but we look at the cult of personality, who do we like better, who seems nicer, who seems this, but we don't look at policy and we don't really understand and look at like voting history in whatever their previous jobs are and those types of things. And I think it's really interesting to like kind of go with, um, you know, like I think that's one of the comments she's making is, can someone from the outside who understands that that's kind of what's going on really maybe make a difference and win? Is that possible? And like Lisa Marie said, like, yes, it's happened before. Like we had a businessman win. Um, and really like it can go, you could say, even going back to Reagan, right? Like he ran as um, for governor and one, right? Like he wasn't a politician first, he was an actor first. And so, right, Jesse Ventura, Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's not uncommon. Like if you looked in my county, like at the voting stats, people wrote Jesse Ventura in for president. I think there was like 28 write-in votes for Jesse Ventura as president. It was crazy. Cause I went and looked at like all the stats. Um, so I don't know. I think it's a really interesting commentary on that. 
and and maybe there's more in here that we haven't yet seen that could be even further prophetic. I love how every time I come to book club, I have more and more thoughts with, with the book, just listening to everybody else talk. Um, I definitely agree with that, Jaina, because the it makes so much, like to me, in my brain, it makes so much more sense to have a one person from one party and another and another person from the other party and work together. But apparently that's too complicated or too simple um, for American politics. And that is, um, words, to be honest, this is my first, this year was my first year voting in a like presidential election. Um, and yeah, that's definitely what I looked at instead of, because I didn't like either candidate. So I'm like looking at the policies and looking at, um, and not just for like the presidential election, but also for like my state local elections. I'm looking at who these people are. And I'm like, because they're just a bunch of names on a poster board sitting on the corner of my street uh, nine times out of 10. So trying to figure out, I was like, well, how is this going to affect, um, you know, people at every level of our community? And instead of trying to just look at it, it's like, oh, who looks the most presidential or who, who do we like more, um, as you said. And so I really did appreciate the fact that with the Rocky Hay storyline, we did get to see kind of how that could look within an election and pardon me like really hopes that it's prophetic um and that we do get to see something like that happen in the future because especially this year especially 2020 I know I keep bringing this back up but um this year has taught us a lot of how how divisive our country is like I've never seen our country more divided than um than it has been in 2020 so I would love to see it kind of turn around and really focus more on community and of course like that has to start with our you know our local governments and well it has to start with our families and it has to start with our local governments and I would love to see um I would love to see that and love to see like what happens from that um no granted could it all blow up and fit flames of course it could but that can be said the same for pretty much anything um any direction that politics and policies go. Um, and I did think that the end of the novel was a little bit too, everything's tied up in a perfect little bow. And I that always bugs me, but I did think that it was as realistic as it could be um, with how the stories were kind of set up. Um, and I thought they, I thought it was cute getting to see like what people's like future plans were and what they were like just having snippets of their life um, after the election and <laughs> yeah, Jaina, I, I hope that means that that's what that means. Um, Jaina's in the chat saying hopefully it means that 2020 will wrap up in a little bow. <laughs> it's like we can all hope, um, but I think that the author definitely chose to conclude the story that way with having these snippets of the widow's lives, both with their husbands and in their jobs, just to kind of show us like life does go on. It doesn't matter who's in office, like life still goes on. And I, I think that was a really powerful way to end the story. Yeah, those are all such great points. Um, I had like a really long discussion with one of my best friends who is on the other side of the aisle from me. And um, at the end she was like, well, I don't agree with anything you said, but I love you and that's not gonna change. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Cause I felt the same way, you know, it's like, we're never gonna agree. And like Anna said, it's, it's, I don't think we've been in this situation before where it's like, it's almost like, when you're on one side, you can't fathom how the other side, like, like you literally, like, it, it's like, I can't put it in my head. And um, if you watch The Social Dilemma on Netflix, it talks a lot about, like, the behind the scenes of why that is, and um, how that's very much by design. Um, and I thought that was really fascinating, too. Um, 
anyway, I also think it's like, I don't know, maybe because I live in California where, um, you know, like it's kind of assumed, you know, that, that, it, that like everyone votes one way, but um, like at book club the other night, one of my friends who I knew was like on the other side of almost everyone in the room, like made a political joke. And I wanted to be like, don't do it, <laughs> like, don't do it. You know? <laughs> so let's not go there because it was our first book club. So like all nine of my best friends were meeting each other. And I was like, no, 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 let's not, you know, let's not go down that road. So we almost need to go back to like, politics, religion, like, just like, is like off the table, um, to come back to community, right? Because like Anna was saying, that's what's going to change the world is community. Um, and this goes back to the direction that I'm pa taking paper and glam, right? Like this goes back to getting out from behind the screens because like, we won't talk to each other that way face to face, right? It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. Um, then, then we, then people become a person, right? Like a story. And once we put all the experience together, it all makes a lot of sense. Um, it goes back to that quote that I'm sure all readers love. We're all a product of the people we meet in the books we read and the experiences that we have. And I love that we can come together in the reading life together. And um, yeah, just, we all love each other and that's never going to change no matter what happens. So also about tying everything up in a little bow. On God and Glam, we were talking about how um, Anne Voskamp has this quote. She, she wrote our devotional for God and Glam for Christmas that says like, she was saying on her blog, like, okay, it's been a really, really horrific year, but we can still crown the year. You know, no matter what, like the holidays start and like that's always the crown of the year. And no matter what's going on, we can finish it well, we can finish it together. And we can put a we can put a crown on it. We do have that ability to put a bow on it. And I'm really excited to be meeting with you guys every Monday on God and Glam, like starting the week off with you guys, and then kind of ending it on Thursday nights um, with book club or the seasonal living stuff that's coming soon. I don't want to announce too much too fast because I want to make sure that it's going to go according to plan and like work out any bugs with all of you guys, but. Um, just starting the week and ending the week in like my new community. I know it's going to be really healing for me and is going to be that bow I think that I need. And that's because of all of you guys. So it means the world to have you guys rooting for me and I'm rooting for all of you too and praying for all of you as well. So yeah, it's been a rough year. We're going to put a bow on it. <laughs> it feels like a new beginning. Yeah, Anna, I love that. Um, it does feel like a new beginning, you know. In California, we had the worst fire season in history, and Anna, librarian Anna, sent me a um, an article about uh, from Ann Voskamp's blog as well, talking about <laughs> this is why I love paper and glam. We're all on like a different page of the same thing at the same time, and it's really weird, <laughs> like all the time. <laughs> Prophetic. Um, she sent me a thing about fire, talking about how fire comes through and it burns everything away, and you're like, okay, cool, like time for the new life, you know. But in reality, you know, I've been saying this whole year, as you guys know, like this, this year has been like a trash fire for me. Um, I moved very suddenly. I was supposed to move in July and ended up moving the first week of March, which thank God I did. Um, right. That was clearly the hand of God. But um, like, then you expect like, okay, like everything's gone. Let me start over. But after a fire, there's actually silence. Like it's just quiet. The fire comes and then the land sits fallow and waits and waits for the soil to regenerate, waits for everything. It's not like, and now new life, time for spring. And that analogy has just been something that's like been, been on my heart. It feels like, it does feel like a new beginning that we can rebuild together and rebuild stronger and um, really serve each other in this new season. Yeah, add, add nutrients to the soil for stronger growth. Exactly, exactly, Jana. Um, Anna. Uh, Maggie, you had me laughing out loud when you said, I also finished the book during election week by design, of course. <laughs> and I was like, right, that's it, like how we all think. I'm like, I have to read this the first week of years, so but I'm like seasonally correct. And then I need to switch into where the crawdads sing due to the fact that it has many, many fall um, images in it. <laughs> that's like how I plan all of my reading. And I just love that we're all the same type of weird because it just, it makes my life. So I think that is it, unless anyone else has anything to add for tonight. Okay, um, well, we're gonna stay on and chit chat like we always do, um, patrons. And those of you watching live, thank you guys so much for um, being live with us. And cheers to a glam new year starting 
pretty much now. <laughs> Thankful for each of you. Have a beautiful Thanksgiving.